So tonight we are very excited to have with us Claire Myler of the California Invasive Plant Council and, and two of um, her team members who will talk to us about um, invasive plants in uh, specifically in the um, San Francisco Bay Area, the way they have taken over crowded out indigenous plants, reduced diversity, biodiversity, and otherwise um, impaired the restoration of our wetlands here in this area. And so uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Claire and her team. Thank you. So I am Claire Myler. Thank you for that introduction. I'm the communications manager at the California Invasive Plant Council. And what we do is we're a nonprofit that works to protect California's environment from invasive plants. Uh, and we do that through education, advocacy, science-based tools, and on the ground projects. Um, and one of the on the ground projects that we work in partnership here um, with a whole host of agencies um, it is uh, the Invasive Spartina Project. And so we're going to highlight that tonight. Um, and our speakers are biologists at, at Olufsen Environmental, Jen McGill and Lindsay Faye Domicus. I mispronounced that. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Jen has been counting Ridgeway's rails for the Invasive Spartina Project since 2005. She got her start in the tidal wetlands of the San Francisco Bay studying song sparrows and marsh wrens after finishing her degree at UC Davis. Since then, she's logged many hours in muddy boots, mapping invasive plants and observing the wildlife at the edge of the bay. Lindsay started at, uh, as a seasonal employee in 2017 after finishing her graduate degree in environmental science at San Francisco State University. And there she studied environmental physiology. At OEI, Lindsay works on a variety of projects, including the Invasive Spartina Project, and spends most of her time working in the marshes of the San Francisco Bay Area. So, take it away. Okay. I'm gonna, um, Lindsay, you're gonna share a screen. I'm gonna start, and then I'm gonna hand it off to Lindsay at some point. Um, but let me. Let's start here. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight um, to learn about the Invasive Spartina Project. And thank you for hosting us for this Green Friday. Um, the Invasive Spartina Project is a project of the State Coastal Conservancy and all of its many partners around the Bay. Uh, next slide. Um, before I dive into uh, Invasive Spartina, I kind of wanted to tell you guys habitats where we work, um, the tidal marshes that ring our bay. They're the vegetated wetlands that um, at the upper edge of the mud flats. They're sandwiched between the marine and terrestrial ecosystems and they provide that connection between the saline and freshwater systems. Uh, you've surely seen them flying into SFO or Oakland airports. They're those green and brown um, meadows and mud flats and you might have smelled them when you've been driving over a bridge with the window down on a summer day. Um, these wetlands are super important to the health of the San Francisco Bay. Tidal marshes are very productive ecosystems that are rich in biodiversity. They provide critical habitat for many aquatic and terrestrial animals who feed and shelter and breed here. And they act as high tide refuge for um, shorebirds who forage on the adjacent mud flats. They also pr provide important ecological services to us humans who live and play on the edge of the bay. Tidal marshes are important carbon sinks, which is critical in the time of climate change. They provide coastal areas with um, firm protection from natural disasters, acting as buffer against storm surges and stabilizing the shoreline against erosion. They also filter contaminants from urban runoff, and they provide us with recreational opportunities. It's a place to walk and get some sun and some smell that salty air um, when we've been cooped up inside for too long. <laughs> Uh, which we all know about a lot these days. All right, next slide. Um, globally, we've lost 25 to 50% of tidal marshes around to human development around the world. And then locally, we've lost 85% of the historic tidal wetlands that we had here in the San Francisco Bay. This slide shows two maps side by side, then and now. Um, back into the, in the 1800s, we had over 200,000 acres of 
uh, tidal wetlands. And now you can see those historic wetlands have been reduced. Those bright green lime color on the right map show where the historic intact wetlands are. There aren't many of them left. We've done a really good job in the decades restoring a lot of tidal wetlands. So that kind of grassy green on the right shows the restored areas. And then the dark green shows areas that we're planning to restore in the near future. Uh, the Bay Conservation Community has a goal of restoring our tidal wetlands back to 100,000 acres in the upcoming years. Um, and even still, despite all of this development and this wetland loss, San Francisco Bay Estuary contains the largest remaining expanse of tidal marshes in the Western US. And it's one of the biggest estuaries in the entire United States. The marshes are extremely productive habitats, recycle nutrients and organic material, and it supports the bay's food web. They're important wintering habitat for waterfowl, all the ducks that we see coming in in the winter, shorebirds. It's a vital stopover for more than a million birds who migrate along the Pacific flyaway each year. Um, we have high city and abundance of wintering and migratory shorebirds on the Pacific coast, more than any other of the wetland systems. And in the tidal marsh, the vegetation pro provides protected areas for many animals that forage and breed and roost there, including several endangered species. Next slide. As you can imagine, the loss of habitat resulted in the reduction in the populations of some wildlife that rely on that habitat. Several of them are now protected under state and federal Spe Endangered Species Act, including these three. On the left, there's the salt marsh harvest mouse. In the middle is the California Ridgeways Rail, which used to be called the California Clapper Rail. And on the right is the California Black Rail. These are all protected species in the state of California. Historically, oh, next slide, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, Historically, the biggest threat to the marshes was human development. Um, but now looking forward, climate change uh, poses the biggest threat to the tidal wetlands. The rising oceans are probably gonna cause marshes to drown. Um, if sediment can't accrete fast enough, if they can't get tall enough fast enough, or if they can't recede up the shoreline up the elevation into the upper edges because we built right up to the bay edge, there's no place for these marshes to migrate and they'll drown with sea level rise. Um, models predict that there's going to be frequent and intense storms due to climate change and that can cause increased shoreline erosion and some of these marshes might erode away. Um, and also if those intense storms coincide with really high tide events, it'll turn the whole bay into a big lake period for a period and those, those animals that depend on the tidal marshes won't have any place to be. So climate change is definitely a big threat to the tidal marshes. But at the same time, marshes provide a lot of services in light of the threats of climate change. They mitigate wave action. They protect urban areas from flooding. And they filter pollutants from the rainwater runoff. Um, they reduce the erosion along, along our built shoreline and stabilize the shoreline and they sequester carbon. So they're really important. We need to save them. Next slide. Um, here's a short history of conservation um, in the Bay uh, as it relates to Spartina, the Spartina project, um, and how we came to value these bays. We, we've lost 85% of our tidal wetlands to development, but it might have been much worse. Back in the 40s, there was the Reber plan that would have dammed the estuary and gave us a couple of lakes instead of the tidal bay that we have now. Um, luckily, the plan was stopped, but it kind of spurred some um, activism and three wise women formed together to make Save the Bay, which helped prevent plans like these from going forward and really instigated um, conservation of the bay. And, value our bay habitat. Um, in the 60s, we got our first legislation that stopped further filling of the bay. And um, by 1976, the State Coastal Conservancy was established. And we started launching some of these new restoration projects to bring tidal wetlands back that had been um, lost to development. 
Um, at the same time with this restoration, there was a marsh plant that was introduced from the East Coast, Spurtina alterniflora, as an experiment in stabilizing some dredge spoils as part of this restoration. And that East Coast Spartina hybridized with our West Coast Spartina and started spreading aggressively. Um, individual landowners at East Bay Regional Parks and um, the National Wildlife Refuge down in the South Bay started trying to take care of this problem that was encroaching on their mud flats and marshes. But they quickly realized that this was a bigger problem. Uh, Spartina can spread on the tide and they needed a regionally coordinated effort. And so in 2000, the Spartina project was born. Next slide. So who are we? Um, we're a project of the State Coastal Conservancy, which is the state agency tasked with protecting our coastal areas. And the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the federal agency that's tasked with protecting plant and wildlife species and their habitats. They are our co-leads and really started the project. Um, then there's the California Invasive Plant Council and Olufsen Environmental, uh, and we manage and conduct the work on the ground. Olufsen Environmental is a small women-owned business, and we staff most of the biologists um, who work on this project. That's where I work for Olufsen Environmental. And then the California Invasive Plant Council helps manage the project. And if you're not familiar, um, they're a statewide nonprofit. They provide resources for land managers that are trying to deal with wild and weeds. And they have a really um, wonderful resource on their website of an entire inventory of invasive plants in the state and the best management practices on how to deal with them. So in addition to these four main organizations, we have over 200 partners around the estuary. If you can imagine the whole Bay Area and Ever, all the lands that touches the water. Um, if, if it's land that touches the water, we're interested in it because that could be where Spartina grows. So um, we have many, many, many partners and in, that includes cities and counties and local state and federal agencies, water districts, mosquito abatement districts, and many private landowners. We're a large network of partners that make this thing happen. Next slide. So before I start talking about invasive Spartina, I want to tell you guys about our native Spartina folio Pacific cord grass. So also renamed Sporobolus foliosus recently, but we stick with Spartina foliosa. And sometimes we call it for short. <laughs> I'll try not to do that, but <laughs> it's tempting. <laughs> um, Spartina foliosa is a perennial with clonal growth. So it grows from rhizomes. Um, underneath the ground and comes up with shoots on the side, big ground clones. It's a foundational species in the low marsh. It's super important um, as uh, in growing in the low marsh. And it also is an early colonizer. So those brand new restoration programs, it's often the first plant that comes in. Um, and then you can see in this marsh zonation diagram where it grows in that low marsh. It, it really just grows right below the marsh. That's the, the pickleweed marshes that um, are really extensive around the bay and above the mud flat. And it just stays in that narrow, low elevation zone, that lane um, where it doesn't um, grow down into the mud flat or up into the marsh and just forms a nice narrow band along the edge of the marsh and the channels. And um, it's really the only species in that low zone. So it's really important to the marshes. And the very good news is that at this point, more than 99% of the Spartina in our bay is this native Pacific cord grass. Like it's, it's good news. It, it, it's looking really nice out there. All right, next slide. Um, but here are the non-native Spartina, the um, Spartinas. There's more than one. Um, we have on the left, you can see Spartina anglica, which is English cord grass. And on the upper right, you have Spartina densiflora, which is Chilean cord grass. It's a bunch grass. These two were introduced to the bay together as part of another um, restoration project. They thought they were native Pacific cord grass, but it wasn't. Um, but they were introduced to the Corte Madera watershed up in Marin and really um, didn't spread too far beyond that region. So, and at this point, we've beat these two back so that there's not a lot left. We have to hunt for tiny little 
sense of Flora Spriggs now. Um, on the lower right, we have Spartina patens, which is called also called salt meadow cordgrass, and it grows at only one site at Southampton in Venetia State Recreation Area. Um, and it, it's been there for a long time and hasn't ever spread out of there. But all of these are species that we deal with. Um, they just are very much reduced to almost non-existent at this point. Um, and then we have hybrid Spartina. That's the picture in the middle. That's the cross between the East Coast Spartina alterniflora and the West Coast Spartina foliosa. Uh, and this is the one where we spend most of our time and effort. All right, next slide. So how did this happen? <laughs> um, back in the 70s, the Army Corps of Years introduced Spartina alterniflora from the East Coast as part of a restoration project. It had the best intentions, but it had unintentional consequences. Um, that hybridization event the, between the alterniflora and the foliosa probably happened sometime in the 80s, I think. Um, but by the 90s, people were noticing it was spreading aggressively everywhere. People started studying it and land managers started treating it and people were concerned. The hybrid Spartina can back cross with itself. It can fertilize itself. And through multiple generations, it created this very fertile hybrid swarm that had many different morphologies, many different forms that could grow in many different tidal ranges. And, and this is where the real trouble began. All right, next slide. So here I have native Spartina foliosa, Pacific cordgrass on the left and hybrid Spartina on the right. Um, and what happened when hybrid Spartina became a thing, um, those two parent species, Alterniflora and Foliosa, produced this hybrid that has more robust characters than either of the individual parents had. This is called hybrid vigor. It's a known thing. Um, but hybrid Spartina has the ability to do what neither parents can do. Um, it, it grows in a greater tidal range. So you can see at the top, I have included that marsh zonation diagram again. On the left, you could see Spartina foliosa really just stays in that low elevation zone. But on the right, you can see hybrid Spartina doesn't. It goes outside of its zone. It goes down onto the mud flat and channels, and then it grows up into the mid marsh and upper marsh. So it really increases where it can grow and take over the whole entire tidal wetland. It also often grows taller than the native, um, which allows it to grow down deeper in the um, tidal frame. And then it can have really wide leaves and really fat stems, and it creates a lot of vegetation, a lot of vegetative biomass, which can exclude all other plant species below it. And it can make these really big flowers, these huge flowers that produce a ton of pollen, and this pollen can swamp out all the other pollen. So even if you have just one big clone in the middle of a beautiful foliosa meadow, if that one clone is producing a bunch of pollen, it will pollinate the native foliosa around it and that foliosa will start making hybrid babies. So um, kind of sneaky like that. And also those really big flowers are really good for seed production. They can make a lot of seed. So um, it really managed to hit the marks to make it a, an expert invader. All right, next slide. Why is it a problem? I've alluded to some of it in the last slide, um, but it can outcompete all other tidal marsh species. It just creates a monoculture of nothing but hybrid Spartina. And it can grow down in the channels in the marshes and alter the hydrology. It can spread across mud flats really quickly, turning um, open mud flats into Spartina meadows. So totally altering the ecosystem engineering, ecosystem engineering. Um, it can grow really thick roots. It does grow really thick roots. Um, and it produces so much dense underground biomass where we can't see it, that it excludes the benthic invertebrates below the soil. And that's, those are, that's a really important food resource for so many of the animals that live in the tidal wetlands. Um, UC Davis did a study and found reductions of 
70% of the underground biomass in Spartina meadows versus the adjacent mudflats. And then even though you know, that remaining um, invertebrates down there go way deep down under the soil. So they're out of the reach of the, um, the bills of the shorebirds that need them. So um, it changes the whole entire invertebrate con community in the mudflats. Um, hybrid Spartina can cause the extinction of Spartina foliosa, the native cord grass. And even though, like I said, there's 99% of the Spartina out there is Spartina foliosa now, um, because hybrid is so sneaky with this pollen swamping, creating, you know, a foliosa that can make more hybrid if that's a problem. And it can outcompete hybrid because it can really, or it can outcompete the native because it can really grow anywhere that, um, hybrid can grow anywhere that the native can grow, but bigger. Um, hybrid Spartina re reduces the flood control. It can grow down into tidal channels and clog them trap sediment and fill it in, fill in those tidal channels. And that can cause flooding in adjacent fields and in nearby neighborhoods. Um, they also found early on with um, when the early on in the invasion that um, the hybrid Spartina altered that that hydrology and created some ponding in the back back areas of these marshes and that increased mosquito breeding. And so, and more mosquitoes is, uh, they're mosquitoes are a vector for disease. So it can mean increased diseases like West Nile virus. So a lot of our partners um, have been the mosquito abatement districts through the years. Um, and it's a really fast colonizer. So we had all these beautiful new restoration sites that are, you know, filled with hope brand new areas that were ready to turn back into marsh and hybrid Spartina could come right in and take over. Uh, and a healthy native marsh is a diverse and complex array of natural habitat features. It's mud flats and these complex channels and low, mid and high marsh elevations and salt pans and ecotomes and hybrid Spartina takes away all of it. It can threaten all of those habitat features. It's just it just wants to be a giant meadow. All right, next slide. Here's a, an example of hybrid Spartina as an ecosystem engineer on the San Leandro shoreline in the East Bay. This is at the mouth of San Lorenzo Creek. You can see this picture from the 80s shows just a few clones on that shoreline. And not even 20 years later, it turned that few clones turned into a giant meadow that stretched much further out on that mud flat. And then if you look really closely at the 2004 picture, you could see at the top end, there's one lone clone out there. And left unchecked, that clone would just march on that short, turn that whole entire mud flat into a marsh. And those mud flat habitats are absolutely essential to the millions of migrating shorebirds that rely on the food that they produce. So it's a real threat to a lot of wildlife. All right, next slide. So the Invasive Spartina project in response to all of these threats was formed back in 2000 and we started monitoring the bay, looking for hybrid Spartina, its distribution and density everywhere. Um, treatment began in 2005 and now we do annual monitoring of 70,000 acres of potential Spartina habitat across the whole entire estuary, which helps support our treatment program. All right, next slide. Here are some maps that illustrate the results of those annual monitoring efforts. Um, moving from left to right, you could see the transition of the density and the distribution of the hybrid Spartina from 2005 to 2020. The, Red areas are areas where there's a lot of Spartina over an acre and the green areas is where there's no Spartina. And you can see the transition moving from left to right, from red to orange to yellow to green. And now we have really a lot of green and yellow um, out there. It looks really good. We've also increased the area that we've inventoried, that we survey over this time period. So we started out surveying only about 50,000 acres, but we've found more Spartina along the way and have to include Sassoon now and some greater 
stretches of the bay, new restoration sites that have been opened that then became invaded that we now survey. So we have a bigger effort now too. All right, next slide. Here's um, the same data shown graphically. You can see we've had tremendous progress since the initiation of the project. We've gone from 805 acres of Spartina down to 33 in 2020. That's a reduction of 96%. Um, it's even better this year based on our preliminary data. Um, we had really fast project progress at the beginning because there were just vast meadows of Spartina that we were able to turn back into mudflat. Uh, but now we really have to work to find that Spartina. So uh, it, it's the progress has slowed, but we are still making progress. And like I said, we had some really good reductions this last year with our preliminary data from 2021. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Lindsay. I'm just gonna tell you how we did all this. All right, thank you, Jen. All right, let's keep going. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay, uh, and I will be introducing you to the Invasive Spartina Projects program. So basically, Jen has just spent the last few minutes telling us why what we do is so important. And now I'm going to tell you how we do what we do. So what are uh, the Invasive Spartina Projects various programs? Well, they're the inventory monitoring program where we go out and map hybrid Spartina. Then we have our treatment program where we go out and treat and remove hybrid Spartina. We also have our Ridgeways Rail program run by Jen McBroom. Thank you, Jen. Uh, where we go out and monitor the population of Ridgeways Rails throughout the estuary. And we have our revegetation program um, where we go and add plants in areas where we've removed hybrid, as well as bolster marsh habitat for rails throughout the bay. Um, so this picture is rather dear to my heart. I spend a lot of time in this particular marsh. It's also in my backyard, so to speak. I live in San Carlos, so Bear Island is just off of San Carlos Redwood City area. Um, it's a huge marsh and we have to boat to it. You can't get to it, hence Bear Island, it's an island. Um, and it's massive. So when you're out there, you really feel very, you're out in nature, sort of removed from the hustle and bustle of Bay Area daily life. You can see in this photo that there are actually two biologists down there. Um, they look like they're probably out doing some inventory monitoring, which I'm gonna explain in a second what that looks like, but uh, it's a beautiful place to be. And um, I think this photo was taken by one of our managers, Drew Kerr, who does some aerial inventory and treatment uh, once a season in a helicopter, which is a very cool part of the job. So to start, I'll be talking about inventory monitoring. So what does that entail? Uh, basically we walk around with handheld GPS units. So on the left, you'll see one of our seasonals from last year, Corey has got his GPS unit in hand. Um, and we use these to take very accurate locations of hybrid Spartina. Um, and there are a lot of benefits of this extensive inventory that we do before treatment. And those include the fact that it saves a lot of time. So we don't have to bring treatment crews out to the whole marsh. We just bring them directly to the patches we've already mapped. Um, in that along that same vein, it reduces impacts to the sensitive habitat. So biologists can lead our treatment crews directly to mapped features, which minimizes walking through the marsh and disturbing this sensitive habitat um, more than is necessary. Uh, it allows us time to thoroughly inventory the marsh and identify hybrid Spartina, um, which saves as much native folios as possible. Um, that's not really an easy task. Hybrid Spartina has a lot of phenotypic variations depending on marsh conditions and location in the bay. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later because that um, variation and difficulty in identification also gave way to our genetic sampling program. Um, so having time to go out and do inventory allows us the opportunity for this extensive genetic testing. We take approximately 500 samples every season to identify hybrid Spartina before treatment. Um, and that helps us not only preserve as much native folios as possible, but also um, helps us identify hybrid Spartina. So we get a really good idea of what hybrid looks like at different sites throughout the Bay. So you've seen this graphic already in Jen's earlier slide, but I just wanted to emphasize um, 
both the monitoring extent as well as the widespread green and yellow areas. So getting a really good idea of like what this means for us having our boots on the ground in all of these areas of the Bay is such a huge effort. Um, we have 220 different sub areas that represent 70,000 acres of habitat. And back in 2020, OEI mapped 33 net acres of invasive Spartina. So for context, that's 0.05% of those 70,000 acres we're finding invasive Spartina back in 2020. Um, so the dark green you're seeing is areas where no invasive Spartina is left. And then that light green is where we're seeing less than 10 meters squared of invasive Spartina. And then I want to call your attention to this area here that the star just popped up next to that little finger sticking off of the bay is uh, AFCC, the Alameda Flood Control Channel. And that's actually the original introduction site for Invasive Spartina. Um, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more later, but the first thing I want you to just notice about it is that it's green. So we've had a lot of success there removing Invasive Spartina and then coming back in and planting native Spartina in that channel. Um, and I have some great photos of that that I'm going to show later. So this is really just to emphasize that this is a huge inventory effort, a huge treatment effort. Um, and most of these sub areas are surveyed every year. We get out there on our feet, um, boots on the ground. We do boat surveys. Um, and so it's a huge effort. We don't get to every site every year, but we definitely get to each site every few years. Um, and that's actually part of our uh, part of our evaluation every couple of years is like, how often do we need to be going to different sites? Um, and we reevaluate that regularly. Okay, so just diving really quickly a little deeper into those numbers. So 151 of those 220 sub areas now contain under 10 meters squared of invasive Spartina. So just 186 meters squared or about 0.05 acres of hybrid Spartina are left in those 151 sub areas. So that means that we're finding most of our hybrid Spartina in approximately 70 acres um, throughout the rest of the Bay. But those are really great numbers and a huge decrease in, in hybrid Spartina in so many areas around San Francisco Bay. Um, and the way that we measure this is actually we use square meters out in the field to approximate the amount of hybrid that we're seeing. So the GPS units help a lot. I can take my unit and find a patch of Spartina and actually walk around the patch and do an estimation of the percent cover I'm seeing in that patch and get a really good idea of exactly how much Spartina I just mapped. Um, for smaller features, we'll even use parts of our body. So we calibrate every year with each other. We go out as a group and do calibration where we look at patches of Spartina and talk about how we would map them. I know exactly how big one meter is on my own body. I measure it every year just to be sure I haven't like stretched somehow, but a meter on Lindsay's body is from my collarbone on one side to my fingertips on the other. So I use that when I'm out in the field to get a good idea of what I'm seeing and what I'm mapping. Um, and it's really those numbers that turn into these numbers that you're seeing here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our genetic sampling program. So OEI biologists use genetic sampling technology to help inform Spartina ID um, in a very, uh, various circumstances. So we use it when field ID is uncertain. Maybe it's early in the season and the plants haven't finished growing yet. They haven't flowered um, for patches that we are, have low confidence about. So maybe there's some phenotypic um, features that we're seeing, but we're not totally sure if what we're seeing is hybrid Spartina. We also use um, genetic sampling when we uh, see new invasion at a site. So we wanna confirm that what we're seeing is fully foliosa or hybrid Spartina. Um, we use DNA sampling to create a genetic baseline for comparison. So we test obvious hybrid and obvious fully, just so we have like a good baseline. Um, and we also use it to confirm native foliosa when we do our restoration planting. So we definitely don't want to be pulling plants um, and using them to, to grow plants in a nursery that we then go plant somewhere else and then find out later that we were planting hybrid because that would be terrible. Okay, so I'm out in the field and I, this is literally what I'm seeing on, on a daily basis when I'm out mapping hybrid Spartina. I'm walking along and I come across this patch and I say to myself, is this hybrid Spartina? I, I don't know. It looks like it's probably kind of early in the season. I see these sort of like skeletons of last year's plants. So maybe this is something that popped up a little early. It's definitely not flowered yet. It's a little bright green because maybe again, everything around is still kind of like growing. It's early in the season. It hasn't 
flowered, it's kind of spiky. Oh, I don't know. And maybe I'm at a site where we're approaching zero detect. So at a site where we have tons of hybrid, I might just map this and say, it looks like hybrid, I'm just gonna map it. But if I'm at a site where we're approaching zero detect, I definitely wanna confirm that what I'm seeing is hybrid or not. So I might take a genetic sample. And how I do that is I pull a couple of leaves off a plant. Um, if the plant is flowering, I'll take measurements. So we have lots of measurements of plants that we've sampled as well. But since this plant isn't flowering yet, I wouldn't take any measurements of it because they wouldn't really tell me anything. Um, but I would pull some leaves and put them in a Ziploc baggie. And then um, we send our samples off to genome advisor advisors in Los Angeles, where they use 15 genetic microsatellite sequences to perform PCR analysis. Um, this is the same basic method that they use for COVID testing. So it amplifies the sequences of DNA, the DNA markers, uh, so that we can see them and read them. Um, and these results to estimate the ancestry of an individual plant. So this graph shows the analysis of several thousand different plants. Um, the tight range and spike for Spartina foliosa, which is in the green, shows that there's a much more distinct signature for foliosa. So for hybrid Spartina in the red, the graph shows that the, there's a much broader range of genetic, genetic diversity, which makes sense since um, as Jen kind of talked about earlier, we have this hybrid swarm created by interbreeding and fat crossing of generations of hybrid plants. So we see this variety of morphologies and that's reflected in this genetic variation as well. So just for a fun analogy, um, let's say Jen has a Labrador retriever. She doesn't actually don't know the makeup of your dog, Jen. You'll have to tell me if you know, but let's just say you have a lab uh, and I have a Border Collie, Australian Shepherd, Cattle Dog, Siberian Husky mix, which is true. I do have that. Um, so Jen's dog is Foliosa pure breed, uh, and my dog is a mutt. So she's a mix, she's the hybrid Spartina. Um, so then looking at this overlapping region, that's sort of where we're less certain where the green and the red overlap. Um, but because our goal is eradication, our threshold for what to treat is set pretty far to the left on the graph, like leading into the green. Um, we do tend to treat most of what lands in this overlapping region. But the challenge, of course, is always to preserve as much foliosa diversity as we can. We don't want to go out there and get rid of all the great foli diversity. We want to make sure we're getting rid of hybrid, but also not just mapping plants because they look different, because maybe they're a foli plant that looks different, and that's a good thing. So it's a challenge for sure. OK. so. Once hybrid Spartina is identified, we have trained biologists, me, Jen, the rest of our team, who work with our various contractors to treat the mapped patches of Spartina. So how we do this is we have a variety of tools in our toolbox, um, and we use the appropriate tool for the best efficacy and minimal impact. And this also does involve some adaptive management. So for example, Spartina densiflora that Jen talked about earlier is one of our invasive species of Spartina. And it's a bunch grass, so that makes digging a little bit more effective um, than it is for hybrid Spartina. But this method is definitely size limited because digging can contribute to erosion on a large scale. So we really can't go out and dig quantities of plants. Um, we use tarp sometimes in small areas uh, on plants that we have a hard time getting rid of. Sometimes we go out and we dig a plant over and over again and it just keeps coming back. But we found that if you deprive it of light, it won't come back again. So tarping is really effective, but obviously not a large scale method that would be effective for us. Um, and then uh, we also use a Mazapir herbicide. That's our main tool in our toolbox for uh, invasive hybrid Spartina. And then obviously we found that rhizomatous plants like hybrid Spartina are really difficult to dig effectively. If you miss rhizome fragments, um, the plant can come back. And that's true for Densiflora too. So when we go out and we dig Densi plants, while we're still at this point finding small seedlings, we give them a pretty wide berth in the soil around when we dig because we don't want to leave anything behind in the soil. So that brings me to talking a little bit about Spartina densiflora, which I just said we dig instead of treating with herbicide. Um, so we have historical densiflora sites that are mostly located up in the Marin part of the bay. And we go to those sites twice annually. We go once in the spring um, when the surrounding pickleweed is brown. So the green density seedlings are easier to see. And then we go back again in June when the plants have flowered, which 
aids in detection, but also isn't ideal for us because the seed bank for Densiflora is five years long. So if the plants go to seed, we've set the clock back in that area about five years. So we really wanna to try to find them when we go in the spring. Um, and we have really, really intense efforts up in that area of the Bay where we have tons of biologists all in very small areas walking like very tight lines across the marshes, like really looking for this plant. Um, so we remove all these plants manually and dispose them off site. We haven't used herbicide and densiflora eradication since 2012 because the numbers have decreased so much to the extent that digging the small the small seedlings that we see is a pretty effective method. And so in 20, let's see, 2020, we had 66 seedlings totaling 5.6 meters squared that we found and removed. Um, I don't know what the 2021 numbers are, but I think they were lower. Uh, so we've seen a 99.9% .9 reduction in densiflora from its original peak. But finding these tiny seedlings is incredibly challenging. Uh, some say that it's like finding a needle in the haystack. I had one coworker that said it was like finding a needle in a needle stack. Um, it's really very challenging. So we have a tough time, but we're very committed to it and the numbers go down every year. So I think we're doing a good job. So to talk really quickly about amazapir herbicide, this is what we use for hybrid spartina uh, treatment. So to treat hybrid spartina, we use this herbicide called amazapir in most areas of the Bay. Uh, the EPA considers amazapir a category four practically non-toxic to wildlife. Um, and that includes mammals, birds, fish, and aquatic invertebrates. ISP has done water quality monitoring that has detected concentrations in the water after treatment that are much, much lower than any amount that would be of concern for wildlife. Um, and there's also a 90% plus reduction detected within the first week because amazapir is broken down by UV sunlight and has a low potential to bioaccumulate. So this treatment takes place with very close monitoring by trained biologists. So this, once this is one of our contractors in the photo out spraying Someone like me or someone like Jen is with him the entire time, not only telling him what to spray, because we want to be very succinct about the areas that are getting sprayed. They should correspond to the areas we've gone out and identified and mapped, but also because we're keeping an eye out for any wildlife nearby. Um, not because the chemical will really be harmful to that wildlife, but because we don't want to be disruptive, especially if we hear a rail or see, um, you know, a salt marsh harvest mouse, we're keeping an eye out for that kind of stuff. So. Uh, we don't do this treatment uh, really during breeding season. Um, so we, we do keep an ear out for rails. If they're nearby, we're just sort of cognizant of where they are. Um, if it's breeding season and we hear them nearby, we get out of there. So it's, um, it's definitely something that we're always thinking about what is, what is uh, the best way to make the least amount of impact in a habitat as possible. So really, the Invasive Sartina Project is an, is an example of a conservation dilemma in a way, uh, endangered species versus invasive species. So human development has led to this massive loss of tidal wetlands in San Francisco Bay, and the wildlife dependent on those wetlands, are have be, some of them have become endangered species. And then human action has led to the introduction of these highly invasive species, which then do help create habitat for some of these animals. So how do we balance removing invasive species while protecting endangered species? And also thinking about the fact that it's not just about the rails or just about the salt marsh harvest mice, it's about the mudflats and the migrating birds. And there's so many different pieces of this puzzle. Um, so what is the answer? Well, it's adaptive management, um, treatment, restoration, surveys to assess populations of endangered species, and then reconsultation uh, going forward. So benefits to the endangered Ridgeways rail. Hybrid Spartina benefits Ridgeways rails. Uh, we know this. It has created brand new marsh where there was none before by invading mudflats and new restoration sites. Uh, it's grown tall to provide cover at high tide, and it outcompetes native spartina and other native vegetation. So the removal of this invasive spartina creates this temporary deficit in ecosystem function, a function that has been temporarily provided by hybrid, but is usually provided by these native plants in this native ecosystem. Because we know that before we int introduced invasive spartina, rails had plenty of native uh, foliosa that perform the same function for them. So how do we keep an eye on these rail numbers and make sure that what we're doing is jiving with them and, and we're keeping the numbers up? Um, we go out and we do these uh, call count surveys between the months of January and April. So that's 
time of year that's coming up. I know Jen just took a group of our seasonals out to start getting them trained uh, on their call count surveys. And basically we have these data collection points that are located approximately 200 meters apart along a transect. And we have lots of transects throughout the Bay. And we stand at each point along that transect for 10 minutes and we broadcast a minute six and seven, uh, both Ridgeways rail and black rail calls. And then the survey results that we get represent some subset of the population at a site. So not all birds will call in that window when we're out there. Um, we found that about 60% detection probability uh, according to one USGS study. Um, and once we get all that information, we go back and we actually manually plot those birds on a map um, back at home or at the office, back when we got to go to the office. Uh, and that gives us an idea of the actual number of birds because we will hear birds from multiple sites because Ridgeway's rails are loud. Um, you can definitely hear them from multiple sites. And also we go out with different people, like we go out in groups and Jen will be at a transect and I'll be at a transect. We'll actually have to double check that what I heard at a given time wasn't Jen broadcasting her rail call. Uh, but usually we can figure that out if I map it straight to the transect I knew Jen was out. I'll be like, oh, that was Jen. So it's definitely um, a multi-step process and we get some pretty great data out of it. Uh, and it's the skill that's fun to learn and it's really cool to get to go out and do these surveys. So despite the fact that we're removing habitat, uh, our rail call counts over the last 10 years have definitely increased um, the data here was collected not just by the Invasive Spartina Project, but by other partner organizations, include the, including the Fish and Wildlife Service and Point Blue. And this increase is due in part to the successful reg restoration program that helps to mitigate the impacts of removing Invasive Spartina. So with that, I'm going to start talking a little bit about our restoration program. And at the heart of that restoration program is really the Ridgeways Rail, although we have a lot of species we care about and in general care about the ecosystem as a whole. Um, but uh, one of the challenges, one of our main challenges is balancing hybrid Spartina removal with the need to protect this bird in particular. Um, so ISP's restoration program was really born out of that challenge. And our main goal right off the bat was to rapidly enhance tidal marsh habitat to benefit Ridgeways rails primarily, but also other tidal marsh dependent wildlife as well. So the focus of our program has been enhancements at ISP treatment sites. So places that we go out and we remove, remove hybrid Spartina, we wanna get in there and plant native foliosa. So ISP's reveg program was in 2011 and we just completed our 10th year of habitat enhancements and we're just started on our 11th. Um, this program is guided by our plan, which is informed by our tech advisory committee and implemented on a baywide scale. Uh, the program focuses on critical components of rail habitat. So that includes cover from predators for foraging, roosting, nesting, and also high tide refuge. Um, and we actively use adaptive management to learn from our enhancement efforts and inform future efforts. So one example of that is like in the first year of our program, we lost a lot of our native cord grass plantings at one site due to grazing by Canada geese. So we experimented with some rope caging and now at new sites, we initially use rope caging to protect at least half of our native cord grass plantings until we can assess at that site what the risk is for grazing there. So this map here shows the 40 plus sites where we've implemented habitat enhancements throughout SFA. Um, the blue areas on the map show plantings that are primarily planted Spartina foliosa and also marsh gum plant, Grindelia stricta. So I'm gonna show some pictures of that in a minute. Um, the orange dots down there show where we've uh, installed or where high tide refuge islands have been constructed. Um, we have 72 of those at 16 sites. And I know that that number is higher because one of my coworkers was out building one today. So it uh, looks like we're creeping that number up of those great high tide refuge islands. Um, and then the photo down on the right shows uh, ISP staff and contractors planting gum plant along the channel to provide refuge for rails. So um, that's one of our planting days and that's actually one of our photo points. You'll see the pole in it indicates that that's actually a designated ISP photo point and we go out and we take that same photo over and over again. So the way that the planting days work is actually biologists have always already been on the ground in those sites. We go out and we do um, 
a little bit of recon and find the areas where we want to plant those uh, marsh gum plant plants. And the little flag you see is where I've gone out and flagged it and said, this is where we should plant. And then we go out on the day and that section gets mowed after it gets checked for any species that might be hanging out there like the salt marsh harvest mouse. Um, and it gets mowed down and then this little auger goes in the ground and drills the holes and then we put the plants in the ground and then we go out and monitor them every year. So it's a huge effort um, and reveg days are really interesting and fun to be a part of. Okay, so let's see. I mentioned the critical components of rail habitat. So those are cover for foraging, roosting, nesting, and high tide refuge. Um, and in most tidal marshes of SFA, the vertical cover is provided by a pretty small suite of plant species. So we see a lot of plant species out in the marshes, but not many of them are not tall. Um, the tallest ones are really fully and hybrid Spartina, unfortunately, uh, and Grindelia stricta. So um, our program focuses on actively planting these two species, Foliosa and Grindelia. Um, so this slide shows examples of a few sites where we have done some plantings. So here on the left, we have Spartina foliosa at Eden Landing um, up on the top there. And basically that's an early restoration effort. So it was mud, plat, mud flat before, and then we planted native cord grass. Um, and you'll see that over the course of four years from 2013 to 2017, it went from empty mud flat to beautiful band of happy foliosa along the edge of that channel. And then below that is actually a picture that I'll mention quickly, but we'll get into more later. That's um, AFCC. So that's the channel that I pointed out later that was a little finger on the map um, where hybrid Spartina was originally introduced in the Bay. And this is an example of a place where hybrid has been eradicated and fully has been planted. It's staying in its lane like it's supposed to. It's down along the channel. It's not creeping up onto the marsh plain. It's not creeping down into the mud flat. It is where it belongs and it is doing its job. And we love to see that. And then there on the right, you have a couple examples of, um, I think both of these were shoreline of gum plant that we've planted along channels. So rails use these channels as highways. So they have their little nesting spots, um, but they run up and down these channels and they need cover. Otherwise they're exposed to the elements and predators and whatnot. So uh, one of the, well, first of all, Grindelia needs to be a little higher in elevation than, uh, than Foliosa does. So we look for areas of the marsh that are a little bit higher, but also really focusing on channel edges because that's where we want to provide that cover um, for rails and other animals. So yeah, those are two examples of, of plantings that were done. The before and afters really show pickleweed and then Grindelia um, on the right. Okay, so here's a really great example of um, Eden Landing Ecological Reserve. So this photo shows the site back in 2011, which was basically open, unvegetated mud flat um, after the opening of the tide gates and the restoration of tidal flow. And this site is really far from any local source of native cord grass, which would be the marsh plant that we'd expect to colonize um, given these marsh plain elevations here. So we wanted to jumpstart the trajectory of the site from overflat to potential habitat for Ridgeways rails. So we did active planting of native cord grass here. So this slide shows some of those native cord grass plantings. Um, so native cord grass has expanded far beyond what is mapped in this slide. And on your right, you see like a bird's eye view, bird's eye view of the plantings. Um, and this is a map that's been made in GIS, but it looks a lot like the, G the GPS unit that I would carry out into the marsh when I'm doing this work. So the different stuff you'll see on the map is you have the green, which is where we planted fully. And then you have the very faint kind of like orange lines along that main channel up at the north side and then a few down in the south. So those are all of our plantings. And then the letters you see are our photo points. So you have photo point A, B, and C, and those correspond to the photos that you see on the left of the slide. Um, and you can see that the photos were taken back um, when the marsh was opened back up and exposed to tidal flow. And then in the case of the first one, photo point A, six years later, we have this huge transition from open mud flat into happy, healthy foliosa. Um, and those poles you see in each photo kind of help us go back and take the same photo over and over again. So we get a really good idea of what it looked like then and what it looks like now. All right, so here's what this site looks like now, uh, from mud flat to marsh. Um, and the, rear, the Ridgeways rail population at this site has responded by rapidly expanding. So we had no Ridgeways rail detections in 2018. We had eight 
birds that we detected in 2020, and then we had 13 in 2021. So stay tuned for 2022. I think we're going to keep going up, but it's been very, very successful in a lot of ways, especially looking at the real population response to this um, revegetation effort. So last really last thing I'm really going to talk about is just keep wrapping back to this AFC, AFCC um, flood control channel because this was our original introduction site. So we have this example of this rapid spread of invasive Spartina, then successful control, and then restoration with planting of um, Spartina foliosa. So in this slide, just note the size and position of the clones circled in red and blue and sort of their relationship to the rest of the hybrids on the shoreline. Um, the red and blue are just kind of help you keep an eye on them. They don't represent anything other than that blue one is really just the farthest out on the mud flat. So then this photo, which is taken two years later, those two clones in this one that are like just the leading edge have completely disappeared. And then the one that was way out in the mudflat is about to assimilate into the rest of the marsh. So that happened really, really quickly and is very alarming. Um, basically, we went out, we got rid of hybrid spartina, and this is what it looks like now. So it's really, really exciting. Um, the photos show what AFCC looks like now. Oh, this was in 2019, so almost now. Um, after the successful control and extensive replanting of our native foliosa. And these plantings have expanded to reestablish this continuous narrow band of native cord grass that existed prior to invasion and local um, extirpation by hybrid spartina. So, like I said before, if you look at that photo up on the top left, sorry, yeah, left, much side, left, uh, you'll see that perfect band of foley from the top. So you can see the mud flat that gets exposed at low tide. You can see the marsh plain, and foley creeps up on the marsh plain up the channels. You'll see a little bit of it up on the marsh plain, but mostly it hangs out down in that band. And then it's not creeping down onto the mud flat, so it can serve every function that it needs to. Um, without taking away habitat for other animals that need that mud flat that's exposed at low tide. So with that, uh, the Invasive Spartina project is this continuously moving target for us as we continue to remove invasive Spartina, restore native tidal marsh habitat, and continuously monitor the California Ridgeways rail and other species throughout the Bay. And we really hope that working toward this balance can help create and protect healthy native marshes that are more resilient in the face of sea level rise and climate change. Thank you all so much, and we'd be happy to take questions. Hi, in the chat, somebody said, can you speak to MLK and Alameda else Romer, I think that's one of the um, wild bird wildlife spots along the Alameda shoreline. Jump in on that one. Um, so LC Romer and MLK, MLK Regional Shoreline, those are areas around the Oakland Airport, <clears throat> the East Bay. Um, Alameda LC Romer it was really invaded. I, this is one of my, before I worked for the Spartina project, I worked um, studying song sparrows and marsh wrens, and I only had three sites in the bay, and Elsie Romer was one of them, so I spent a lot of time out at that site. It was very invaded. That's where a lot of the UC Davis studies on the invertebrates in the, um, the benthic invertebrates, uh, invertebrates in the Spartina root mass came from, and um, uh, there were a lot of like offshore clones and uh, a very heavily invaded meadow. Um, we reduced that down to nothing, that, and there really wasn't anything for a while, but it's also um, now been a successful restoration site. So we have Spartina, plant, Spartina foliosa plantings along that shoreline, and it's taken a while, but it's actually starting to establish into that nice band along the shoreline. But um, that site is, it's, it's a pretty small marsh that's really impacted by the, its adjacency to an urban neighborhood. I remember I was doing a song sparrow observation before and right in the middle of an observation, I saw a feral 
well, I don't even know if it was a feral cat. It might've just been a cat from the neighborhood out in the marsh. I saw it take the bird I was studying, walk right back out into uh -huh. the street with it. And so, I mean, that, that marsh had, has a lot of um, other threats. There's just not, not a lot of places for the marsh to go there. But we have we have planted and, and we're starting to see the marsh come back growing, but just in the, in the more narrow bands that's appropriate for the area. Makes me want to go back out there and look around. Haven't been down to that corner of Alameda for a while. I'm going to say a new marsh is that that marsh is one that we haven't treated for over a decade. So that one's um, still in invaded by non-native Spartina. It's um, pretty densely covered. Um, there's some, we have some high tide refuge islands in there that you know, we've installed in the hopes of when we start treating Spartina, there's a place for Ridgeway's Rail to go, um, but we, we don't, it's not currently on the docket. So that'll be in, in conversation with US Fish and Wildlife Service um, when we start working on that shoreline, that part of the shoreline, how we transition from high bridge to native marsh there. That's a, that was a young restoration. It, it was opened right around the very start of the Spartina project, MLK New Marsh. I remember when it was like nothing but a couple of sprigs of um, invasive Spartina and mostly open mud flat. Um, that, that restoration site was mitigation because there was some illegal dumping um, near there. And so they ended up putting that marsh in, but it, it was right at the time where invasive Spartina was expanding really, really quickly. And it was, it's the perfect example of a site that went from mud flat to nothing but Spartina. Um, and yeah, we still, we, we paused we paused there because we have that conundrum with the Ridgeways Rail and the hybrid Spartina at that site. Um, so we're just waiting, um, restoring areas nearby so that there's some place for the Ridgeways Rail to go when we can finally get back in there and start treating that site. But we haven't we haven't actually done much of there for like a decade, except for count birds. <laughs> This is, uh, this looks like just such an, uh, a labor intensive uh, project you've got going on here. How many people do you have, you know, working over the course of a year? There's, well, so how many biologists do we have on staff? It's, uh, we have more in the summertime um, when the, the bulk of our, our inventory monitoring work happens, um, but up to, 20, 15 to 20 biologists. And then we have lots of contractors that are out there um, doing a lot of that work. So uh, uh, when you add those guys in, there's another 40. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of boots in the marsh. Um, so many of us have been doing it for a really long time. Um, even the contractors, they're contractors that keep coming back year after year. So we've all been doing it for quite, quite some time. Um, Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you for all your work. Is anybody looking at other species in addition to the rails, you know, just to see if there's any other kind of response to this? Is there some starving grad student at Cal that is out there looking at the harvest mice or anything like that? No, there's not a lot of work on the harvest. There, there's work on the harvest mice, but not as it relates to invasive Spartina so much. Um, there's, they're just harder to study because the way you do it is you have to trap them and it's a tidal system. So if the tide comes up, well, you have a mouse in a trap, that's not great. Right, right. <laughs> um, so they're, and, and in order to trap them, you have to have special permits and those right. are pretty intensive to get a hold of. But there is, there's been actually, I don't know if it's happening this year, but there's been a talk of a big coordinated push to do big salt marsh harvest mouse surveys from soon all the way down to the South Bay with the refuge. Um, so uh, it, that's probably upcoming. I, 
and I don't do a lot of work with the with the mice, but I do talk to other biologists that do. And so that that would be really cool to see. And we do we count other rails in the marsh. We um, but the the shorebirds are kind of a big question mark right now. The main people who survey shorebirds are Point Blue does a big effort in the fall where they take volunteers. It's a volunteer run survey at a really high tide. Everybody's assigned to a different spot in the bay and we're supposed to all simultaneously count the shorebirds. And um, that's like, that's, you know, a, a big mystery is what's happening there. Um, yeah. That's amazing. We have a, another question here in the chat. It says, <clears throat> seems like you can't possibly eliminate all the invasive plants and given their ability to quote travel, wouldn't they just repopulate once you stop the project? Well, that's, I mean, I think that's really why when Spartina project got started, it was, it's contained. So we have the bay um, where it's really in here and, it, and, and we started the project before it got too terrible where it was still manageable. So eventually the idea is to, eliminate all of the invasive plants in the bay and then there won't be a place for it to repopulate from. The nearest invasive Spartina plants aren't going to be in California. Um, so it, it is possible. Um, and, and certainly there there's probably going to be some hybrids that act like foliosa that are going to we're not going to detect. Um, but if they're staying in their lane and acting like foliosa and doing the same ecological fun function as foliosa and not taking over mudflats and taking over marshes, then I think we're okay. We know that there's going to be some hybrid genetics that are still going to be out there even when we're done. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that question implies that at some point you're going to stop this project, but are, are you really? Isn't there going to be some ongoing maintenance for indefinitely? I mean, I think that eventually there's going to be probably citizen biologists that will have some place to report. Um, there's, you know, there's always going to be East Bay Parks and the refuge that are going to be, you know, have eyes on their own properties that will have some mechanism in place to be able to report their sightings and um, if, if anything pops up that we miss, but hybrid genetics scare, you know, I, hybrid genetics used to scare me, but now I realize that like once I understood, we took, we did a big conference where we took a bunch of really smart people and geneticists and brought them together. And, and we talked about this, like the idea that we can't get every last hybrid gene that's out there because if we can't see with our eyes, we're not sampling every leaf blade in, the bay, we can't do that. So, you know, most. So at this point, if it's if it acts like foliosa, then we're counting it as foliosa. So if it's staying in its lane and not growing in a weird place or a weird way, then, I mean, yeah, those genes are out there, but they're usually the plants that act like foliosa have a signature that are much closer to that green spike that Lindsay showed on that genetics page. And so it's, they're much more similar to foliosa. And so, I mean, maybe there could be some hybrid back crossing monster in the future, that, but <laughs> I think most likely we, we, we have, uh, we have, you know, if it can, if, if the plant can behave, then it can stay. <laughs> Okay, are there any other questions from people on this uh, Zoom meeting? All right, well, uh, I'm just amazed. This is this huge, overwhelming project that, you know, I, I, I didn't ever know about before. I'm so impressed and amazed. And thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you for hosting us tonight. Yes, thank you for having us. Oh, well, thank you. Joanne, anything you want to wrap up with? I don't, I don't have anything else to wrap up, but Liz, somebody just asked, uh, where will the recording be? Ah. Um, 
the recording will will be uh, posted on the Sierra Club's. We have a website. All of these Green Friday uh, re recordings are posted on the Sierra Club website. Um, it'll take a few weeks. Um, I have to, you know, of course, convert it and then send it to somebody else in the Sierra Club who does something with it and posts it. But it's on our YouTube site, so it should be there um, eventually. Oh, okay. I, I Go ahead. catch the last comment on the chat. The last comment. Yes, oh, when, when will we get the recording? Don't have questions. Found this very interesting. Thank you all. And then we have a link. Oh, great. Thank you, Claire. Claire yeah, I just dropped in a link to the project. Um, and that project page has uh, links to the Rail, Ridgeways Rail Survey Report. Um, so if you wanted to look at lots of cool charts about the birds, you can dig in there. <laughs> oh, fabulous. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Okay, with that, well, thank you for sharing. I was going to say thank you for sharing your evening with us. It's um, been very informative and uh, just a great uh, educational presentation. Um, such a new uh, corner of biology to me, and such an extensive project. Yeah. yeah. So I appreciate your time. I certainly learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.